21 Stone Station. Presence. If you aim at two ducks, you miss them both. Ram the train window. A Zen monastery can be discerned, high up on AF hillside. It is very similar to the one visited by the Stars of Enlightenment. Guaranteed, the movie released by Doris Dree in the year 2000. This is more of a documentary than a movie. Since the actors use their real names and improvise their lines based on a very loosely sketched storyline, two German brothers, Uwe and Gustav, decide to travel to Japan to get over their respective personal crises and to find themselves in a Zen monastery. After wandering around lost in Tokyo for a few days, they manage to reach the Sojiji Monastery where the monks will teach them to devote their whole attention and all their energy to just one thing at a time, meticulously folding a napkin with cutlery, polishing the wooden floor, meditating or reciting mantras. During filming, the camera simply documented the monks carrying on with their daily routine while the actors joined in. Multitasking leads to burnout and underperformance. These days, distractions have taken control of our lives. Complaining about technological change or turning your back on the advantages it offers is absurd. But what we can do is make decisions so that we are the ones who control technology rather than the other way around. As we explained in the Find Flow in Everything You Do chapter of our book Ikigai, numerous studies have shown that human beings are not efficient multitaskers. Firstly, because of the limited attention we can devote to each thing. Secondly, because each time we leave a task then go back to it, we suffer. Greatly from fatigue. This would explain why we feel exhausted after devoting an hour to multitasking, whereas a gardener or a painter can spend four hours concentrating on the same thing without feeling tired. Although we might feel we are making better use of our time if we are watching a YouTube video, revising for an exam, and answering messages on our cell every 15 minutes. We would actually make much more progress if we divided our time up into three parts. Time for watching YouTube, study time and time for answering messages. An old hunter's proverb goes, if you aim at two ducks, you miss them both. Sitting down is zen, walking is zen, the iPhone is zen. Once when I was walking around a temple in the Nagano Mountains, I felt transported back to the distant past. I went into a Buddhist temple and saw the monks meditating in a sparsely decorated room. The meditation session ended and each monk returned to his chores. One of them came out into the garden and sat down on the bench where I was having a green tea. I was amazed to see him take an iPhone out of an inside pocket. He was happy and smiling as he answered the messages. He even let out the odd belly laugh. Then he put the iPhone back in his pocket, turned to me and asked me my name and where I was from. While I was answering him, he looked into my eyes as if I were the only thing that existed for him in that instant. After this initial conversation, I asked him, doesn't the iPhone distract you when you're practicing Zen? But do not waver. The monk's reply was a variation of the saying, sit down, walk, walk, do not falter. This Zen saying contains the essence of what we call mindfulness, being present in every moment, feeling our body and our consciousness in whatever we may do. Whenever we are sitting down, let us devote all our consciousness and body to being seated. Whenever we are walking, let us do the same but concentrating on the act of walking. And the final part, do not falter, reminds us of the importance of being fully present in everything we do. Some ideas to avoid faltering. If you are eating, move the cell phone away from the table and do not look at it until you have finished. Even more so if you are eating with others, since they deserve your undivided attention. If you're having a stroll, enjoy the walk as if it were the most important thing in the world. If you are taking a shower, 
Imagine it is the last one you will ever be able to take in your life. Value. Each instant the hot water is massaging your body. Divide your day into time to flow and time to let yourself go. Just as the Zen monk has time to meditate, to answer messages on his cell, and to talk with a foreigner. So we too may design our everyday life to include intervals of complete presence. In this way, rather than being led by what is urgent, we will be the ones taking control. A simple technique to achieve this is to put some moments aside for ourselves during the day in order to fully concentrate on one thing. First single flow concentration segment. Start and finish time. Task. Second single flow concentration segment. Start and finish time. Task. Third single flow concentration segment. Start and finish time. Task. Observations. The Pomodoro technique we explained in Chapter 12 may be used in each flow segment. Let yourself go the rest of the time that falls outside the concentration segments. You don't need to spend the whole day like a Zen monk, ND station. To write is to select. The power of putting pen to paper. Writing is one of the most effective therapies there is. The patients treated by the psychotherapist Shoma Morita, 1874-1938, to whom we devote a chapter in Ikigai, express their emotions on paper every day. When we allow what is inside of us to come to the surface, not only do we clarify and order our thoughts and emotions, we also clean our subconscious of unnecessary burdens, which helps our life to speed up and head in the right direction. Medical Benefits of Writing Modern science has shown the positive effect writing has on our health. UCLA's Dr. Matthew Lieberman used fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, in his experiment to scan the brains of his subjects, who were divided into two groups. One, those who wrote about their emotions every day. Those who either did not practice this habit or only wrote about some neutral issue, such as work reports. After a few days, amygdala activity among the people in the first group began to drop, which was a physiological sign of good health and low stress. The study concluded that writing about our life and emotions helps to regulate the amygdala's activity, which in turn regulates the intensity of our emotions. Creating yourself. In my diary, I not only express myself more openly to how I would talk to, in my diary, I not only express myself more openly to how I would talk to another person, I create myself. My diary is a conduit for my personal identity. It represents me as an emotionally and spiritually free person. So, it is not a simple account of my everyday life. It is something more. In many cases, diary offers me an alternative. Susan Sontag, A Logbook of Your Life. The important thing about keeping a diary is that, as its name suggests, you write in it on a daily basis. There is no need to do anything sophisticated. Simply, sit down at the beginning or end of the day and write the first thing that comes into your head. Write about something exciting that has happened to you today, or about plans for the near future that may be taking shape in your head. Try to bring to light the positive side of things. Regarding this last point, of course we also experience unpleasant things in life. Write about them, but ponder what you could have done better to stop them from happening. The fundamental questions are, one, what have I learned after this bad experience? Two, what changes do I need to carry out in my life for other kinds of things to happen to me? Create a five-minute diary, grab yourself a notepad whose color and design inspires you. If you do not have one to hand, buy one that you will use solely for this mission. Start a new page every day. Draw a horizontal line through the center. One, write for three minutes in the top half straight after waking up in the morning. Two, 
Write for two minutes in the bottom half before going to bed at night. Now you have created the sections. Let's get to the writing. In the morning, one minute for each item. Three things I should be grateful for at this point in my life. Three things that will make the day that is about to begin special. Statement of the day, today, I'm going to. Try not to think too much about what you write. As in the art of haiku, which we will see in another chapter, it is about writing the first thing that comes into your head when you open the notebook. The exercise is not called the five-minute diary for nothing. Let's carry on with this express diary. At night, one minute per item. Three great things that have happened today. How could I have made today better? In the three great things, write the most exciting or significant thing to have happened to you that day. They can be trifles, but things you were not expecting when you woke up that morning. For example, a friend who hadn't written to me for a year messaged my cell phone and that made me feel loved or strolling through the park, I had a fantastic idea for my next personal project. When explaining what you could have done to make the day better, you might be tempted to go into lengthy explanations, but it will be much more useful if you are brief so as to let your subconscious learn while you sleep. It could be something like this. Today I was swamped with urgent things in the night morning. I should have taken control and prioritized the important stuff at the start of the day. For www.intelligentchange.com blogs, news, five-minute journal tips. Further information about this technique see RDST I O N Haiku. Awaken your inner poet. He poet Basho used to say that haiku is what is happening here and now. This is why these short Japanese poems can be used to express an emotion on paper, as though they were paintings or photographs. In addition to being an art form that activates our very essence, haiku is a great tool for self exploration. Traditionally, it is composed of three verses with five, seven, and five syllables respectively, which aim to be as simple as possible. The verses cannot be over-elaborate or contrived, nor can they even be too subjective. The poet's brush strokes must be presented bare, metaphor-free, and uncomplicated. Basho Matsuo, 1644-1694, is considered the first great haiku master. Through the simplicity of his verses, he tackled more complex and traditional types of poetry, like the hundred verse renga. Basho advocated the rejection of artificiality, and through his haiku, he aimed to find the meaning of life and to be in harmony with nature. This classic poet was followed by many other Japanese authors who developed this art form at times giving it a more descriptive or emotional tone, but without forsaking the spirit of the haiku's brevity. After the opening up of Meiji-era Japan, the haiku art form fascinated writers from all over the world, like Jorge Luis Borges, Octavio Paz, and Jack Kerouac. Pedal Dance Idling Wind Eternal Springtime H. Tour How to Write a Haiku this book's authors tried their hand at this tiny art form to prove that it is possible to write a haiku in a non-Japanese language while keeping its essence. In very simple terms, Albert Lieberman's El Orbol de los Haikus, The Tree of Haiku Poems, establishes the following elements which must be taken into account when it comes to writing this kind of poem. 1. It must consist of three verses which do not rhyme. 2. It must be short enough to be read aloud in one breath. 3. Preferably, it will include some reference to nature or the seasons. 4. The haiku is always written in the present tense. Although verbs may be omitted, it never looks into the past or to the future. 5. It must express the poet's observation or astonishment. 6. One of the five senses must be present in the verses. 
30 haiku in 30s days the act of writing a haiku is a magnet that attracts our mind to the present and opens up unexpected places inside us we propose that you devote yourself to this art form every day for the next 30 days as an exercise in bearing your soul all you need to do is devote a couple of minutes the ideal haiku emerges spontaneously without thinking about it to writing three verses to express what you are feeling here and now. You can use a notepad, a note-taking app on your smartphone, or even Twitter. The literary merit of the haiku and where you write it is not so important. What matters is making it a habit over the course of 30 days. Let's take a look at the process. 1. Choose an appropriate time of day, for example, when you are on the way to or from work. Two. Breathe deeply. Look around you and ask yourself, What can I see? What can I feel? What can I hear? What can I smell? What is the essence of this moment within me and around me? 3. After answering this question, don't allow yourself time to think. Just write down what has emerged in three brief lines. After 30 days, read them all. Can you find any pattern or topic that is repeated? Your haiku are probably giving you clues about things you like and value and about where your life is going. But which you have overlooked since you are always too busy thinking about the past and the future. 24th Station. Crucial Decisions. Initiatives that change your life forever. Act Day. Without exception, we make little decisions that shape our present and affect our future in one way or another. However, some particularly important decisions are especially relevant and change everything. That is why we find it hard to make them. Leaving a job that is draining us, starting or breaking up from a romantic involvement with someone, changing our profession, city or even country, becoming parents, giving up lifelong habits, each one of these decisions will affect every aspect of our life. Just as with the bullet train, which made it necessary to change the very concept of what a train was, as we saw in the first chapter, certain decisions are the equivalent of being born again. Since nothing will ever be the same as it was before, in adulthood, each person needs to make 10 to 12 crucial decisions which will mark their destiny as a human being. A crucial decision is one that means a before and after in your life since it affects all the areas of your existence. Joseph and Tony Balinches. A snapshot of your life within the crucial decisions category, we would include some which are made by millions of people, like giving up smoking or eating meat, reevaluating one's sexual orientation, ending a marriage, leaving a steady job, completely changing one's career, religion, or approach to life. A good measuring rod to know how involved we are in our future would be to consider how many crucial decisions we have made since we first started to hold the reins of our life and how many more we would need to take for our train to reach the destination we wish to reach. The exercise at the end of this chapter is aimed at visualizing this snapshot, a necessary step towards the accomplishment of our life goals. How I got here. One Saturday evening, after a seminar with Dr. Bolinches, I was thinking about which crucial decisions brought me to where I am now, and one of the most important was this one. To never again work in a company. I made this decision after a very negative experience as an editor. I have stuck to this decision for 15 years now and have sometimes paid a very high price for it. Next, I realize that I have recently made new decisions that may be crucial because they are already transforming my life. Not to sit in front of the computer at night or on the weekend, apart from the odd email. That was something really groundbreaking for me because in my first 15 years as a freelance, I would work from Monday to Sunday and from the morning until bedtime. I didn't even get away from the computer on trips, never again to beg for anyone's affection. 
If someone decides to distance themselves from me, I let them go and stop fighting for their attention, however much we may have shared previously. Within this category, I would include freeing myself from the obligation to always be friendly. It is no big deal if somebody can T-stand you. You cannot please everybody. To devote half my working day to people, not to screens. That is, to take on fewer of the jobs I don't feel like doing and give individualized attention to more people that I can help with the tools I have at my disposal. To make the unconscious conscious. I came to the conclusion that I had done many things throughout my life that I really didn't want to do. I felt uneasy or worried, but I never asked myself, why do I feel bad doing this? The moment you dare answer that question, the subconscious unease becomes conscious, and you can understand it and act accordingly. That is when real change comes. Francesque. It is normal to feel dizzy when making crucial decisions, like anyone else venturing into the unknown, but if you stay where you are, you will sink without having taken a single step. That is why it is worthwhile analyzing where you are every now and then, and detecting the warning signs life sends you, so that you can make the necessary changes to give your ikigai both mental and physical breathing space. Snapshot of crucial decisions start by analyzing your important past decisions, encompassing the moment you managed to take each step and the effect it had on your life. These decisions may be to do with your studies and or philosophy of life, diet, social life, sexual orientation, priorities, etc. Next, examine the effect each one had on your everyday life. 1. Consequence. 2. Consequence. 3. Consequence. Carry on listing all the great decisions you recall making and the influence they've had on your life. Next, Record the crucial decisions your life is demanding at this time and the benefits that making them would have. In this way, you will motivate yourself to take the step. 1. Consequence. 2. Consequence. 3. Consequence. Continue the list until you have written down the most imperative changes. Even if the sum of the crucial decisions from the past and those you are going to make now does not reach 10, there is absolutely no need to worry. The initiative you take today will bring other big changes in the medium term that will revolutionize your reality. 25th Station, Night Shift, Activating the Nighttime Office. Ach night, we journey to unexpected destinations. When we close our eyes, e we take an unknown train that carries us through unforeseen settings. We do not know how our dream world works. It is one of the mysteries of the human mind. But history shows us the relevance of what happens when the nighttime office is activated. Sometimes it even plays a decisive role in our present and future. Lucid dreaming. Lucid dreams have been a controversial topic for decades among psychology, physiology, and neurology experts. Unsurprisingly so, since they allow us to be aware we that are dreaming. And this, in the almost always uncontrollable world of dreams. Despite the fact that the existence of lucid dreams has been corroborated for some time now by all kinds of testimonies, this phenomenon had not been scientifically proved until a few decades ago. During a lucid dream, the person who is dreaming is aware they are dreaming, which gives them the rare freedom to explore the corners of their subconscious. The knowledge that we will not be harmed in any way, and so can roam around our dream as we wish opens up to us a world of possibilities. Can you imagine it? Waking up within a dream. While barely 20% of the people are believed to have lucid dreams on a more or less regular basis, there are techniques to induce and improve this cerebral ability which, among many other things, may enable us to find the answers that don't come to us in the waking hours. This has been demonstrated by the researcher Stephen Laberge of Stanford University, one of the pioneers of lucid dream studies 
who has devoted most of his career to discovering their ins and outs. After many experiments and tests with patients, Laberge was convinced that these dreams may boost our learning ability and therefore promote our ikigai even when we are asleep. In his book, Lucid Dreaming, a concise guide to awakening in your dreams and in your life, he explains how one of the sleepers he was investigating was able to improve her skills as a hockey player thanks to the lucid dreams she was experiencing, in which she dared to leave her fears and doubts behind her. The sportswoman subsequently decided to apply what she had learned during the dream to her skating, and her ability improved considerably in her waking life. How to be dreamonauts, scientists have established that most lucid dreams happen in the REM sleep stage, when there is most brain and physical activity, and that there are two main triggers which bring about oniric lucidity. 1. Something unexpected or strange happens in the dream, for example, places and things that are not exactly as they are when we are awake, which enables us to realize we are asleep. In this way, we continue in the dream, but are aware we are dreaming and are able to interact with the sleeping mind. 2. When we are woken briefly by some external noise, we quickly fall back into the same dream as before, but this time we are aware we are asleep because we were awake seconds earlier. When we achieve lucidity, the possibilities are almost infinite, since we can access corners of our mind that we cannot reach consciously in the chaotic, stressful world that surrounds us. Lucid dreams may help us to overcome fear, train our skills, recover lost knowledge, or even to make decisions and check where they may lead us. Richard P. Feynman, the winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics, claimed that dream lucidity came to him after a lot of practice and work. For him, as he explained in his memoir, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, the secret lay in being aware of what he was thinking about and of the ideas going around in his head as he allowed himself to fall asleep. I kept practicing this watching myself as I went to sleep. One night, while I was having a dream, I realized I was observing myself in the dream. I had gotten all the way, down into the sleep itself, Richard P. Feynman. Once Feynman had become aware he was dreaming, he could consciously decide how he was going to move around in the dream. It is said that this ability helped him to develop his scientific discoveries. If you find yourself thinking while dreaming and realize you know you are asleep, don't miss the chance to make the most of those precious minutes. You are inside one of those rare lucid dreams that open the door for you to your most deep knowledge. And perhaps the secret to your ikigai is to be found behind one of those doors. Three steps for fostering lucid dreams. One, before going to bed, write or read about the subject you would like to find in the maze of your dreams. If you have some doubt or unresolved problem, leave a written record of it for your nighttime office to work on. 2. A short meditation, even if only to pay attention to your breathing for a few minutes, will help you to enter the dream world more consciously. 3. Have a notebook close by your bed where you can make a note of your last dream every morning when you wake up. Keeping a record of dream episodes systematically will make you more aware of them and thus help you to detect them through the night. Reading the last dreams in your diary before sleeping will help you in this respect. 26th Station